The problem that we're really focused on is the gender wealth gap, how much she has versus a man is 32 cents. So she makes 84 cents, but she only keeps 32. And if she's a black woman, it's only a penny. We all know that if you want to improve a society and make it fairer, you get more money in the hands of women. Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, the former chief executive and also a leadership advisor. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they've challenged the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. Also, you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. So today we're going to speak with one of the highest ranked women to have ever worked on Wall Street. She is not only a wonderful role model for many younger women, helping them to be successful in business today, but she's actually also working to redefine women's financial futures and financial health through her innovative investment company, Now, Clark, you know our guest really well, but I have to say this is one truly amazing lady with a hugely impressive track record. She's done it all. She's turned businesses around. She's changed corporate cultures. She's made some really bold moves and not been afraid to hold back her opinion. And she's even had two very public dismissals. She has been there, done it, and she's literally now also written the book. And she's done all of this in a very male-dominated sector. So I'm actually just really fascinated to meet her and hear her story. Clark, tell our listeners who our guest is. The Nas, excuse the gravelly voice, but I'm really excited that Sally Krawcheck is joining us, an old friend of mine. I think probably more ink has been written about her than almost any other woman on Wall Street. She's probably kind of tired of that by now. But she's not only successful and, as you would expect, pretty smart, but she has it my grandmother from Virginia called Southern Moxie. She is the CEO and co-founder of Elevest. Elevest is an innovative financial company by women and for women. It's one of the fastest growing digital investment platforms, has been named on CNBC's top 50 disruptor list, LinkedIn's 50 most sought after startups. And uh, before launching Elevest, Sally was CEO of Merrill Lynch Wealth Management and probably best known um, having grown up as an equity analyst on Wall Street. She became the CEO of Stanford Bernstein, later the CEO of Smith Barney, the brokerage business, and then CFO working for Sandy Weil of Citigroup. An amazing track record, an amazing person. She's a pistol with a great sense of humor. Sally, thank you for joining us on Redefiners. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Sally, your career is clearly, truly impressive. And we obviously want to hear about some of the lows and the highs. Um, But we're actually also keen to learn about the younger Sally. So can we sort of start with the early years? Can you tell our listeners about your formative years and how you got to where you are today. I've heard you talk about sort of growing up half Jewish, half waspy. What does that mean? It means um, that it felt like sometimes I didn't fit anywhere in Charleston, South Carolina, where I grew up. I, you know, there was sort of the debutante group um, and then there was the Jewish community. As a family, we, we weren't all the way in one or all the way in the other. And in my high school, Uh, There were very few Jewish kids there. And, you know, I was teased mercilessly by the other girls in middle school. And I mean mercilessly. I was the kid who ate lunch by herself um, on the steps when everybody else was, you know, playing the games. I was wasn't always the last one chosen for the teams, but I was typically sort of the the second to last. Um, And so it was, you know. It was the best of times. I guess it was the worst of times because I was, you know, a privileged little white girl, but yet one who was, you know, often left out. Which, Sally, I I don't know if this resonates with you, but your story resonates with me. I was the only child, the only girl in my old girls school in the UK that had a monobrow. Being Iranian, I was the only one that had super hairy legs at the age of 10. So, and then I was also often actually the only one alone in the playground. But I think you just learn to become resilient. And I think 
those experiences actually only grow to make you stronger. That is what they tell you. Um, but you you just got to wake up every day and go back in there. So, you know, I've been quoted as saying there was nothing that they could do to me at Solomon Brothers in the 1980s, which was a pretty rough and tumble, pretty misogynistic culture. You know, there was nothing they could do that was that was worse than, you know, middle school. And there's there's frankly some some truth to that. So then how did you get into finance? I wanted money um, because the other part of my childhood is the only thing my parents fought about was money and they fought about money. And it was every month when my dad would sit down to pay the bills like clockwork, this couple who were so in love, they were making out in the kitchen. Oh, mom and dad, stop. Yuck. Um, would fight so hard about money that one of them would often leave the home. And, you know, it was the only place in which they were unequal, where there was sort of this, you know, toxic power dynamic between them because my dad made all the money and my mom spent all the money. And it was worsened by the fact that they took out loans to send us to private schools. My parents wanted to give us a, a better education. And so they were pretty deeply in debt. So, you know, why did I go to Wall Street? Because I wanted to earn money, because I didn't want to have that toxic dynamic in my life. Sally, I've known you for 20 years, and you know I'm Irish, and they say we're balanced because we have chips on both shoulders. You've got no chips. You've never played that card in New York City or on Wall Street, at least from my perception. You just plunged ahead. You moved ahead. You kept going. There was no woe was me. No. Well, I, I had, you know, I had a day or two that I actually was on the phone with you, Clark, after I got... I remember. ...go on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. There was a woe is me day that you and I shared. That's yeah, true. But, but in general, it's also recognizing, all right, those were some tough times, but I am super privileged. You know, I, I am a white woman who understands that if I lose this job, there's dinner on the table. We're not going to be out of our home. I know how fortunate I am. Sally, can I ask, are you able to share with us that uh, story that you just shared? Because I've, I've heard Clark's version of it. I'd, I'd love to sort of hear your version of it and what it felt like to go through what you did. Ah, getting fired on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, it's happened twice. Yeah. So which story do you want? <laughs> which time? Does, it, does it get easier the second time? <laughs> it does get easier the second time because the first time... I was at City. I was running Smith Barney in a City private bank. I loved my job. I loved it. I loved it. I loved the team around it. I loved what had been the city culture, which has shifted and changed over time. But um, there was an entrepreneurial component to it. We were turning around Smith Barney. And I had a business disagreement with the new CEO. And so, you know, that's, that's just what happens. But it broke my heart. It broke my heart. When I was let go at Bank of America, you know, after being brought in to turn around Merrill Lynch, when Bank of America bought it during the financial crisis, and the damn thing was turned around. I mean, you know, we'd been in there a couple of years. I brought in a team. We'd been in there a couple of years. We got the attrition rate down to a fraction of what it had been. We were beating plan. We were gaining share. We were moving forward. And, you know, the CEO said, you're essentially not a culture fit. And we're going to, you know, <laughs> Clark, you remember this. This job that you have, we're going to give it to a 60-plus-year-old uh, white gentleman who's never run a wealth management business before. But we think he can run the largest in the world better than you who's got plenty of experience. Really? If y'all don't want me, you can't break my heart twice. This is probably the best day of my life. If you don't want me, I don't want to be here. I just don't know how it's going to be one of the best days of my life. Well, the first one was when you, you had actually, if you remember, you had flown in from Turkey, where you had led some meeting of a huge group of representatives, as I recall, and you called up and you said, you know, I just had one of the pump up meetings that I love, that I, I will do anywhere, anytime, and I come back to this and it's going to be in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> um, and you said, I can't have that much of a dichotomy yeah. in 24 hours. You know, what do I do next? It was a moment. I remember being in my office, having flown back from Turkey, and glancing over my shoulder, you know, everybody at the time had CNBC on in their offices, right? It was a thing. And there is a woman and is going to be fired, has been fired. And I'm like, wow, that, that woman's about to have a bad day. And then I'm like, 
oh my god it's me it's me <laughs> Man, that's that's that, nowadays people get ghosted. You watched yourself on TV get fired. It was wild. I sort of like, oh, that that blondie, blondie woman. <laughs> so you're laughing about it now, but how in that moment, to your point, you know, thinking this lady's going to have a bad day and realizing it's you, how'd you pick yourself up? So every time I get fired, I give myself a good 24 hour pity party, and you know, and I've been fortunate enough in the positions that I've been let go from, that I've managed 20,000 people, 30, 40,000 people, and people are kind. And so in come the emails and you just drink and obviously don't shower the next day and, you know, just let it sort of wash over you. And then the next day is when you say, okay, you had your 24 hours time to pick it up. And, you know, what I did, I've, I've told this story before, and Clark, you may remember this, but what I did the second day after Bank of America is I actually called all the members of the board, which, you know, took something. And what I wanted to do was, number one, it's a small world. So thank you for the opportunity to run this large business. And while I have you, if you're willing to, what could I have done better? Um, and it was really interesting um, because I, I shocked people into answering it. And, the, you know, the answer was... At the time, you just didn't have anybody fighting for you in the boardroom that, you know, when it came time to reorg and move, you, you know, even though your business results were there, if you didn't have anybody fighting for you, then it's hard to argue against the yes, but he could do the job. Be if she can do that, beat, plan, and gain, share, imagine what he can do. Just a big eye opener for me. Would you say that those dismissals were the most redefining moments in your career? Or is there another moment that's had an even bigger impact? I've had a couple in my life. Clark, I think you know this. I've, I've had two like kaboom, lightning out of the sky. I've just had a thought that's gonna change my life. One was back when I was in my late twenties, I was eating a pear and was unemployed. In between jobs, I'd quit my investment banking job because I really just hated it that much. And was like, what am I going to do next? When I kept going over it and oh, and I like to write and I like analysis and went, boom, I should be a sell side equity research analyst. And it just, when it hit me, it was like, this is exactly the thing to do. And by the way, I think not, not to brag because women are taught not to brag, but it was such a fit that I was ranked number one a year after, you know, starting covering the Wall Street industry, which is the industry I covered. So that was moment number one. And I like to say, that moment happens, of course, to so many young women, the old, boom, I want to be a sell-side equity research analyst. But the second and even more meaningful one was putting on my mascara one day, and I kept going round and round post, you know, being running Merrill, post running Smith Barney, the city private bank CFO. What, what do I want to do? What am I good at? What, where can I have an impact? What do I want to do? What am I good at? Where can I have an impact? What's important to me? You know, do I want a huge office? What matters? What matters? What matters? And was sitting there and all of a sudden the big thought was the retirement savings crisis is a woman's crisis. Why? 80% of women die single. Women outlive their partners six to eight years. And when men manage the money in the family, which they still traditionally do, and that money comes back to her, 74% of women have a negative surprise. So if there's not enough money for retirement, she's the one who suffers. And then sort of the, what can I do? Well, at the time, there are a lot of lean-in books. Everybody's working on the gender pay gap. And I began to iterate through it and said, wait a minute, the gender wealth gap is the bigger deal. Women only own and have 32 cents to a white man's dollar, a penny for black women, a penny for BIPOC women. Well, what makes that up? Oh, the investing gap. And that's when I started down the road to Elevest of, you know, what matters to me, mission and purpose and change. And what can I not uniquely do, but almost uniquely do? Or put another way, what is it that I am the only one foolish enough to, to start to do? <laughs> well, Sally, you talk about that. And you and I've chatted before. Elevest, you've run businesses of massive scale. As you said, 20, 30, 40,000 employees in, in, in the business you ran. And you said, this, this isn't a business of scale. This is Sally finding investors and, and finding clients. It is incredibly difficult to start a company, particularly, you know, an innovative company, a, a direct-to-consumer company, 
a company that is built to help individuals, in this case, women change their behavior. You know, I think it, it's maybe a different thing if you start a consulting firm or something, but this is, we're trying to solve a problem, how to get women to invest, which nobody's been able to solve at scale. And we're not quite sure why they won't invest, but there's an industry hypothesis that they're risk averse. Maybe they're not risk averse. Maybe it's the industry where, you know, 98% of mutual fund dollars are managed by men, overwhelmingly white, 86% of financial advisors, men. Maybe, maybe they built a business for themselves, not because they're mean. They didn't mean to, but they did. And maybe there's another way. Wow. Is that a difficult problem? to solve. You know, lots of people have tried, everybody's failed. Let's solve a behavioral change problem at scale. At the same time, you got to get money for it because you got to spend some capital to do it, but you can't get the money until you have the people, but people don't want to join you. You can't pay them and the money and the people and the problem and the, and you haven't even gotten started yet. And then the raising venture money, I mean, that's a whole other podcast as a woman, and particularly a woman who's not 22, where on the one hand, you know, you, I can get a meeting. And on the other hand, there's not a single venture capital firm in the United States of America that's saying, you know, you know, the kind of entrepreneur we want to invest behind? A woman in her 50s who used to be the CFO of Citigroup. You started as an equity analyst, as a contrarian, mm -hmm. and you're doing it again. Oh, yeah. Is that a comfort or that's a cross you like to bear? Like, what's the deal? I'm just a difficult person. You can, can you imagine what it's like being married to me? <laughs> but you know, Clark, you, you've, you've really hit on something I think that's sort of interesting, which is a research analyst, in order to be really successful, in my view, you had to be a contrarian. Because if you were in the pack with everybody, oh, I think Merrill Lynch stock is going to go up too, just like the 14 other people who you've talked to. What's interesting about that? Nothing. The only way you could really have a hope of, of breaking through in a big way is to be the one who's standing alone. Um, and the only way you could be right in a big way was to be the one standing alone and then everybody comes over to sort of your side of the room. So it was interesting because I really wanted to be successful. So I had to be contrarian. And then being a Southern female, where we're taught not to be contrarian, we're taught to be ladylike and to go along and smooth things over. I mean, that was a really important chapter in my career. And then I think the same thing holds, as you've noted, with a startup, that if you're the same as everybody else, you know, trying to do the same thing as everybody, there's no market room. You know, for us, we got a lot of addressable market in women. And look, Sally, I am one of those. So I am really curious to know how does Alavest actually help women because I like to think I'm intelligent. I've got three degrees. I've worked my entire career. I earn a good salary and yet I have no clue what happens to my money. It it goes to an account and my other half deals with it. <gasps> I do I do often no! think <laughs> I do often think heaven forbid if something happens to him, I have no idea where my money is. I don't know what's being what's happening to it. And and I trust him and you know, he is taking care of it. But how do I you I trusted my first husband too. I trusted him so much. He took care of our money. He's now with my ex-friend. The numbers are against you. 90% of women manage their money on their own at some time in their life, whether they want to or not. doesn't matter how nice their, their partner is. You know, as mentioned, we live longer than they do. In my mid-50s, I have got a number of friends who, you know, their husband has dropped out of a heart attack. Their husband had cancer. Their husband left him, right? The, the odds are really, really against you here. And do you know when the worst time to find out you don't have as much money as you thought you did, or you don't know where it is? When he is no longer with you. I've seen it too many times. And we as women have been socialized that this is what we're supposed to do. That for us, every message we get, 90% of articles written on money to women are negative about saving, about coupon clipping, about the right size of Tide to buy to get the whitest, sparkliest wash. 72% of articles to men are about investing and growing. And so women, their number one emotion around money is overwhelmed and isolated. And for men, it's power and strength. Look, I don't want to get too ultra feminist here, but in a patriarchal society, men have received the message that they are good with money. In fact, that they're better with money than they are. And women have received the message that they are no good with money. 
And so we outsource that to the man. And I'm very hopeful that you and your partner talk about money all the time, because the more often you do, the happier couples are. But in some relationships, as with my parents, sorry, mom and dad, that money then becomes a form of, you know, unbalanced power. In fact, there is no domestic abuse without financial abuse. As the only guy in this uh, podcast here, um, uh, help me here. It must be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so, so LFS is about financial investing education or about yep. investing so women get more money that they've invested? Great question. Our mission is to get more money in the hands of women. We started as a digital investment platform. By the way, so this is sort of interesting. When we, we spent two years doing research into what would help motivate women to get involved with their money in the first instance to invest. And of course, they all told us they wanted financial education because that's what we've been programmed, right? And we actually broke through it and said, we'll provide lots of that, but let us actually provide a product that is tailored to you. Well, what do you mean? Okay, here are a couple of examples. In our investing algorithm, we are the only one that take gender into account. Why does that matter for women? Because we earn less, our salaries peak sooner, we take more career breaks, and we die later. If we assume you're average, you risk running out of money. Another fundamental difference that we found is in most of these at the time, part of the onboarding is what's your risk tolerance? What we found is that gentlemen who weren't sure, and frankly nobody is, would make an educated guess and keep on. Women would stop and leave and say, oh, that sounds super important. Let me go buy a book and figure it out. And then you know what they did. They did not buy the book and they did not figure it out because that is, you know, what I love to say, what's, what's uh, more interesting than reading a book on financial education? The answer is everything. And so she stays away. And we then added from there, you know, having built an investing platform, banking, and a ton of coaching services, money coaches, career coaches, et cetera, so that our goal is a big one, which is to surround her on all things money from college to credit. Yeah. And your, your portfolio construction, not to get too technical mm -hmm. for our listeners, but uh, this is back to risk and risk aversion or risk taking. Yeah. This is a stock and bond portfolio. You yeah. have alternatives yeah. there as well. De depends on depends on you know what your situation is. It's everything from our newer investors with less wealth, less complicated needs, um, with an ETF portfolio that we construct for them, not based on trying to outperform a market, but based on that thing that motivates women, which is, hey, I want to buy a house in five years. How much can I afford? And what are my chances of getting there? Whoa, I want to have a baby in three years. What do I need to invest to do that? I want a trip around the world. So it's 100% goals-based investing constructed with ETFs, the only gender aware. As you move through um, and you're a more sophisticated, you know, you're successful, you're more sophisticated, you've, you've got millions of dollars. We have a private wealth offering that really is based on much of it on impact. Women are very motivated by investing for positive impact. And we have, I, personally, Clark, I think the most interesting assortment of impact-based alternatives that, that anyone has right now. We'll be right back with Sally Krawcheck after a quick break with Jenna Fisher, a managing director with Russell Reynolds Associates in Palo Alto. Let's get right to the core of the problem. There are simply not enough women at the highest ranks of business in America to fill the demand in both the C-suite and in the boardroom. Although women are graduating in higher numbers than men from college and graduate schools, many at the top of their class, the gender balance continues to favor men at the highest levels of the workforce. Why is that? Many women either downshift their careers or drop out of the workforce entirely when they have children because it seems untenable to balance the demands of a high-powered career with being a parent. That professional pause to care for young children is often seen by boards, executives, and recruiters looking for top talent as a negative, all but disqualifying a talented female professional from moving up. Is this fair? Of course not. But fair and equal are not the same. We need to fix this broken system to help ensure women have the opportunity to reach leadership roles in business. This would help achieve gender parity at all levels and have a dramatic influence on gender equality across the workforce. 
something that businesses have been struggling to achieve for some time now. Companies want to hire more women executives, so let's implement the solutions to get there. To learn more about how you can build a fairer, more equal workforce for everyone, go to russellreynolds.com slash insights. And now back to our conversation with Sally. So pandemic, enormous pressures in the homes, young couples, men and women, people making career decisions, biggest dropouts uh, or leaves or sabbaticals are women, particularly Mm -hmm. kind of early to mid-career. What's your advice for people trying to have it all, find the pace, find their way? No one's got the guidebook for post-pandemic career planning. Well, I think one thing we know today is you know who you work for now, and it may mean you want to stay there, and it may mean you want to go find something else. Whatever the company's slogan is or the words on the wall, you, you know who they are. You know if they provided flexibility. You know you know, if they provided support that people needed. Those of us who are privileged enough to work from home, on average, we saw that men were getting promotions three times the rate of women during and coming out of the pandemic. So did your company work to combat that or did your company go with the flow or was your company worse? Because I think sometimes, you know, we sort of put it all on the individual and say, well, you need to this, this, that, and the other. And sometimes you work for a boss who, has a lot of implicit and inherent biases, even though he or she's really super nice and you're never going to get promoted. And sometimes you work for a company that, you know, talks about flexibility, but then hurts you when you take it. We also have had very much illuminated as a country that as sociologist Jessica Calarco said, we learned during the pandemic that other countries have social safety nets and the U.S. has women. So let's just be clear about who we are as a country and that we have not supported women and that the advancement of women was built on pretty flimsy scaffolding. And look, that's a bit of why we've got Elevest because I love to say that investing is the best career advice women aren't getting. What? Well, if you invest and historically the stock market's gone up 9.7% annually and you're compounding over time and you're earning the hundreds of thousands, for some women, millions of dollars they've been missing out compared to men because men are investing, but even just the percent of their wealth, men invest a greater percent of their wealth than women. Well, do you feel better about take this job and shove it if you've got money in the bank or if you don't? And so the work we're doing at Elevest is about more money, but it's really about more freedom, more career flexibility, you know, more, you know, get out of the relationship that doesn't work, get away from the boss who's a jerk. It's, it's bigger than that. And Sally, have you looked at the gender pay gap as well? Because we are, we are now in sort of 2020, we were certainly better off um, than we were in the 80s in that the latest research shows something like women are earning 84% of what men are earning now versus in the 80s where it was 64%. But we've been stuck around this 84, 85% for the last 15 years. Why is that? Why why is there still, you know, why is it plateaued and why is there still a gap and how do you overcome it? What do they say? It's 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 because um men choose high paying jobs like lawyer, banker, doctor, and women choose low paying jobs like women, lawyer, women, doctor, women banker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We can laugh at the comment, but unfortunately it's true. We all know. Gender shouldn't make a difference as men and women are performing in the same job. At Russell Reynolds Associates, over 50% of our partners are women, and they're leading the firm forward. And we're making strides, but we got to do more. For our firm, for our clients, we have to do more. What's interesting is there was progress on the pay gap, and it was slow. And it was way too slow for women of color. For white women, we were years away from parity. Black women are 100 plus years and Latinx women 200 plus years away from parity. The problem that we're really focused on is the gender wealth gap, how much she has versus a man is 32 cents. So she makes 84 cents, but she only keeps 32. And if she's a black woman, it's only a penny. Would you believe that was going backwards even before the pandemic? And the reason is if we go back to business school 101, the power of investment compounding. 
which has increased the racial wealth gap, the gender wealth gap. In fact, this is going to sound surprising, but but after a moment won't be. Black millennial women have less wealth today than the generation before them had at the same age. Wow. Wow. And you think about these young women who are who are just making it happen, but with student loan debt, et cetera, they actually are worse off. We are going backwards. I get it. It almost feels like we're making one step forward and then two steps back. It's frustrating. So we got to get women and minorities on the career track. We're doing some great partnerships with McKinsey around accelerated leadership, with Valence going in many different cities in the world. But it's this sense of the awareness, both the education, but also that investment. Awareness for women of getting that investment compounding. Even if it's as I tell my 25-year-old daughter, Devin, I'm saying, Devin, you, no matter, it doesn't matter how little you put in every month, as a young single woman, you need to start saving, which she's doing. So it's a dual track to make progress. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. You've, already, you've really got to be intentional about it. Um, and you have to, you, you, have to, you have to be willing to give an order. You know, I mean, at it, Elevest, we were at risk of becoming non-diverse. In our case, it was gonna be a bunch of white women. And I had to tell people they could no longer hire until they could bring in individuals who brought diversity to the team. And I remember my co-founder like, we can't do that. We gotta let our managers manage. It's a meritocracy. That's my co-founder voice, obviously. It's a meritocracy, <laughs> he doesn't say anything like that. But it was sort of this embedded like, let them do what they're going to do, and then we'll judge them later. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I, no, you know, we've got such great investors at Elevest, you know, Melinda Gates and Penny Pritzker and, you know, a number of the all-rays women v- venture capitalists. We're, we're just going to do this differently. We, we owe it to them. And so you have to really be intentional and you have to keep at it because we all have these embedded expectations and biases. And, you know, you always sort of think just because we got from 20% women to 50%, it's going to stay. You know, it doesn't necessarily stay there. People who close their gender pay gap find they have to go back the next year and close it again. Okay, Sally, glass half full, glass half empty. I have three daughters. You have a daughter. What does Sally Krawcheck say now, looking at her daughter, about her career, about her independence and her choices? Look, we are in a situation where women's reproductive rights are under attack which put aside politics, put aside belief, you know, is economically harmful to women um, and particularly to women with fewer means. At the same time, we were within spitting distance of being the last developed country and almost the last country in the world to have mandated paid parental leave, which again, you know, where the gender pay gap starts is when a couple has their first baby. And he gets a daddy bonus and she gets a mommy tax. And that we could go through the pandemic, see the impact it had on women's families, their careers, and that we aren't going to pass that is discouraging. We all know that if you want to um, improve a society and make it fairer, you get more money in the hands of women. That's just known in developed economies that if you get women more money, their families are better off. Society moderates, nonprofits are better off. So this increased wealth disparity is is really hurting all of us. Now, the positive is that some companies are increasingly getting it and seeing that they are winning if they get it, like a Russell Reynolds, right? You're there first, you've got a talent arbitrage at Elevest. We're 50% people of color, our engineering team is majority women. We've got a talent arbitrage. And of course, my friends and I all find that It's actually much harder these days because it's not just about succeeding professionally, but also personally too, and having a good family life to go back home to at the end of the day. Yeah. I'm struggling with with my son at the moment is a backlash against um, how hard I work. I always thought if I set a good example and show him that, you know, if you work hard, you can achieve what you want, you can buy what you want, you can kind of reach your dreams. Unfortunately, and and actually COVID has made it worse because he's seen me at home more and he's seen me at my laptop more than with him. Um, The backlash is you work too much, mom, put the laptop away and be with me. So that's what we're struggling with at the moment. Yeah. I do remember earlier in my career when I was 
for, you know, I had my first really big job and I was traveling a lot and traveling globally a lot. And, and I remember my son was young at the time and coming in and saying, you know, I want you to travel less. I, I miss you and I need you here. And he left and, and my husband and I were standing in the bedroom and, and Gary looked at me and said, well, what are you going to do about that? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. What are we going to do about that? You know, and then we started sort of a system whereby, and this was in the old days, of course, but pre-COVID, where one of us would be home every night and we just had to sort of put together the jigsaw puzzle of who it was going to be um, rather than it just to be put on my shoulders. I think it's so unfair to put it just on the shoulders of the mother, which unfortunately is often what happens. Um, but I think you are spot on that it's actually the responsibility of both parents. Sally, thank you for such an enlightening conversation. Sure, of course. We like to end each podcast with a series of rapid fire questions and ask you to reply as quickly as possible. Are you ready? I am ready. So number one, where is the place that makes you the happiest? Quag, New York. There you go. Uh, if you could only eat one food again for the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> Pasta. And what is the best thing that you have bought so far this year? What is the best thing I've bought so far this year. Oh, 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 I got a used pair of Chanel boots from my friend, Julie Wainwright's The Real Real for like 80% off. Very nice. Even better. You got Nanaz on that one. Yeah. 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 You're talking her language. Too bad you can't see it's, Nanaz in, 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 in full regalia right now. Come on, but re recycled Chanel, you know, you're not hurting the environment and you've got a, you know, an anti, you know, beautiful, beautiful piece of, of work of art. What is your most and least favorite part of working from home? My most favorite part is being with my cats all day. Um, and my least favorite part is trying to figure out what to have for lunch. <laughs> and often having the same thing for lunch day after day. <laughs> oh, again and again. <laughs> that egg salad. Yes. Yes. salad. And then the last <laughs> question, Sally, what's the one item on your bucket list? On my bucket list? Um... I, I, I'm, I'm a travel the world. Scenes from movies and other countries come on. And Italy, and I almost physically ache. Um, I'm just, I'm ready to go. Sally, thank you so much for joining us. As I reflect a little bit about this conversation, you said loud and clear, when you face a setback, you have 24 hours for the pity party. Have a cocktail, stay in your PJs, but then you got to grip it. you got to jump back in. You've got to move on, and enough's enough, or you won't come back. The role of the contrarian I thought was fascinating. To break from the pack, you sometimes need to stand alone and get people to come to your side of the room, bring them to you. So the intellectual horsepower and conviction to be a contrarian, to stand alone. And maybe sometimes standing alone in that childhood playground probably gave more confidence to stand alone in the boardroom as well. And from an investing standpoint, this sense of compounding returns are actually working against black women, Latinxes, and women in general, understanding that investing provides flexibility. It gives you freedom because you're right to improve society, move money into the hands of women. It's a fact. It's not a myth. It's a fact. And companies are starting to get it about diversity. To win is not just the balance sheet. It's the balance sheet of leadership, people, and conviction. So Sally, you've shown a lot of conviction in your career, and I'm sure you're going to continue to do so. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I had so much fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com. Find us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time.